Uh, so thanks for coming. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, what you have uh, in, in this book uh, is a, a case study about the, the changing face of public transport in Dar es Salaam uh, from the 70s up to the present day. And uh, what the book does is it draws on a quite fine-grained interdisciplinary political economy uh, and on long-term research. Uh, this project started as my BA dissertation, uh, then it became my MSc dissertation, uh, then my PhD was on a completely different topic, but it was on the history of uh, development in Tanz Tanzania. So I was in Dar es Salaam for archival work, and these archival work days were followed or even cut short by follow-up research on uh, uh, these public transport issues in 2001, 2002. Then there was a, a career break from academia, and when I uh, came back to academia here in Oxford at the African Studies Centre in 2008, I started doing these uh, uh, short trips of three weeks a month every year from 2008 up to 2014, when I uh, began trying to wrap it up. So it's a slowly cooked uh, piece of uh, research. And uh, I'm keen to emphasize that, you know, when people see here is a case study, they switch off as if is only talking to people who want to know about Dar es Salaam or Tanzania, while at least in my mind uh, there is an ambition to engage intellectually with uh, uh, writings that are much wider than uh, the specifics of Dar es Salaam through the lenses and the experience of Dar es Salaam. So what are the bodies of work that I try to engage through this uh, 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 detailed case study of public transport? There are two obvious bodies of work that uh, I try to engage. One is uh, the literature on uh, uh, the informal economy, economic informality. How do we understand the fact that in these cities so much of economic activity happens in the so-called informal economy? And second, we are talking here about uh, uh, one of the key uh, services in uh, any city. So it's about understanding the literature about cities in developing countries. And I decided to call it Taken for a Ride because as I try to relate my findings to those who write about these bigger things, I found that two bodies of work, namely uh, the mainstream market fundamentalist writing about economic informality and the so-called post-colonial approaches to uh, understanding cities in the South, for me are misleading, unfit for purpose. They don't help us to understand reality, at least as I uh, understood it. So I want to start uh, spending the first 15, 20 minutes of my talk trying to deconstruct, and if you agree with me, distract this kind of uh, bodies of works, to then show what an alternative and more fertile way of studying a public transport as an entry point to understand the city and the informal economy might look like. So as you know, uh, if you are uh, familiar with this literature, there is this clash between uh, understanding African or Asian cities as a dystopic, chaotic, uh, versus a new approach that is what I associate with the post-colonial approach that says this is Eurocentric, this is normative, uh, what we need to understand that there is a, a different order to the cities that uh, makes inadequate to call them dysfunctional. And today I suggest that there is a strong momentum for hope if you look at uh, key positions of our power in academia, uh, key journals, editorial position, keynote lectures, speeches, uh, key conferences. These post-colonial approaches have a lot of uh, traction mileage. And I want to start by interrogating what is the basis for this kind of uh, narrative, uh, the empirical basis, the theoretical claim, and the political policy agenda that derives from this. So post-colonial approaches to the African cities are all about saying that we need to move beyond this normative, teleological, Eurocentric reading of cities in the South as dystopic. We need to move away from this obsessive focus on materialistic explanation of urban realities that make us only talk about failure. We need to move away from political economy and developmentalism, i.e. this attention to different levels of development as an entry point to understand urban realities. I have a number of quotes to bring on board uh, those who are not familiar with this literature. Apologies for that, but I think they are useful. So this is Simone, very famous and very influential. He says, urban life should not be seen as a series of policies gone wrong, uh, 
agency and determination by urban Africans to find their own way is key to understanding urban societies in Africa. Peter Sir, professor uh, in uh, uh, South Africa, we locate slums with their teeming complexity in a black box devoid of complex agency and determinants. So you can start seeing how agency is a word that does recur a fair amount. The book who wrote a very famous uh, book about Kinshasa uh, writes what one needs in order to turn an open space into a garage is not a building named garage but rather the idea of a garage. So a very bold attack against political economy as if Resources, access to land, ownership of tools don't matter in opening a garage. All you need is an idea to create a garage. And Robinson, perhaps more ambitiously, says enough of calling Maputo Dar es Salaam dysfunctional. Every city must be understood as ordinary. I don't know whether you're familiar with a book called Ordinary City. So, to summarize, reiterate, African cities, order and functionality is there. It just does not follow the experience of the North, but we need to move beyond these Eurocentric readings of cities. Now, this is not just a theoretical abstract talk. It is an agenda that claims to have important political and policy implications. Because if you follow what Peterson says, he says, once we open our eyes to the phenomenology and practices of the everyday, they can become the touchstones of radical imaginings and interventions. So the role as a committed post-colonial academics is to recuperate the constitutive humanity and by extension generative powers of the ordinary. Simons adds another layer and say, as African cities are built on people as infrastructure, policy formulation must draw on such infrastructure. Now, I apply a number of very basic layman type of questions to this work. What is ordinary? What do these people at the grassroots or ordinary citizens do every day when they get up in the morning? What do these concepts such as people as infrastructure and generative powers really mean? From what sources do these generative powers derive and what do they actually generate? Are these generative powers able to fulfill this transformative potential that is referred to? Do they make a dent on poverty? And do these uh, cons contributions have anything to say about what generates poverty in the first place? And the linking the, the, the theoretical and policy agenda, can we really think of this radical intervention towards better urban futures? if we don't understand the root or structural causes of poverty? Is it true that political economy suffers necessarily uh, uh, of teleology, reductionism, uh, uh, and a too crude understanding as you seem to get this impression from this writing? And when we talk, like Robinson does, about every city as ordinary, isn't this a case of extreme relativism? Where does it lead us? Are there other competing better ways to understand the African urban experience in more fertile and comparative terms. So these are the kind of questions that animate my critical engagement with this post-colonial literature on the city. Once I apply this question to, uh, pose this question to the, to the works of the scholars, I walk away quite empty-handed about what kind of answers I find. So this is a Natal and Bembe, key scholars writing about Johannesburg, and responding to a critique by a political economist called Michael Watts who says these people as infrastructure really doesn't mean anything. So what do they respond? They say the difficulty with having to act through the provisionality that people as infrastructure implies is that the meanings of the tactics employed can hardly be pinned down. Now it might be actually very difficult and challenging to make sense of the reality out there but one can't help noticing how little empirical efforts and field efforts there is in the work of Natal and Bender about Johannesburg. Uh, Simone similarly talks about innumerable possibilities of combination and interchange that preclude any definitive judgment of efficacy or impossibility. Of course, stating the obvious that reality is open-ended, there's a lot of fluidity and uncertainty, but isn't our work as scholars to trace and understand what of these uncertain situations are more recurring than others. 
Or do we want to walk away saying everything is possible? It's a bit dull, isn't it? So then moving to the informal economy, I become very interested in understanding, given this focus on the everyday, uh, how do these scholars understand people at the grassroots and what do they do every day in Africa? So understand how do they understand informal economy activities? This is a quote again by Peterson, running out of quotes, don't worry. And it says, clearly, as long as the contemporary capitalist system persists, uneven and highly exclusionary, it is likely that it will serve the interest of the majority of the poor better to retain their autonomy. So this idea that the informal economy is a space where people being excluded by capitalism retain their autonomy. A, th a, a theme, this one of the autonomy, that recurs even through the works of uh, many of the scholars, like in the quote before from Peterson. I would suggest that this is misleading, highly misleading. I will explain in a second why this is misleading. But I think what is interesting is that this idea of economic informality as a space of, of autonomy of the poor from uh, uh, capitalism it links very neatly with the second body of work that I told you I wanted to engage, and that is mainstream economics understanding of economic informality. And here the work that is most important is the work of uh, uh, De Soto, uh, who wrote so famously that uh, to understand the explosion of informal economic activities in the cities of the developing countries, we need to understand that the poor do not so much break the law as the law breaks them. So the fact is that behind the growth of informality, there is a choice by informal economy actors to not comply with unnecessary over-regulation of economic activities that is breaking their back. If you ask what kind of actors you find in the informal economy, there is again a bold, direct attack on radical political economy. Because here, the sort of rights Marx would be shocked to find out that in developing countries, much of the teeming mass do not consist of uh, oppressed legal proletarians, but of oppressed extra-legal small entrepreneurs. So the idea that in the informal economy, you will not find exploited wage laborers, people working for other people, is more a mass of a very small-scale entrepreneurs operating their own very small-scale business. This is again not just a theoretical standpoint, it comes with very important political policy and practical implications. Because if you frame economic informality as this realm of a small scale enterprises, what then you will do is pump up millions of dollars as microcredit, as formalization of property rights, as a, a programs of a small scale enterprises development. So this is a link between theory and policy. And the book, uh, if you wish, wants to say that this way of framing both the urban experience and the informality is irrelevant, disconnected from the reality faced by poor people in many cities. So two different notions of agency, uh, two different notions of agencies, but a similar uh, shortcoming, a major one, the incapacity to read, study the agency of the poor alongside a much needed focus on structural constraints against any meaningful approach of agency should be based. Uh, what we know is from a wealth of uh, studies that do exist about the informal economy that is foolish to think about informality as a space of autonomy uh, and exclusion from capitalism. Informal work for the very poor in African and Asian cities is about being incorporated in very brutal and adverse terms in capitalism in two sets of very highly precarious and uh, oversupplied markets. One is the markets of very small scale activities where basically you have people out competing each other, trading very small value goods, very low value goods. And the second one, which is the one that takes center stage in my book is the market for work, for labor markets, where people are, don't own anything, they just sell their labor without any state regulation, with all the uh, perverse consequences that come because of that to other people. So that's uh, clearly a dysfunctional situation. You might call me 
normative, Eurocentric, I don't care. But the point is, when you have a city where you have hundreds of thousands of people desperate to find work that is not there, or you have hundreds of thousands of people out competing each other, selling water, biscuits, various low-value goods, that is a dysfunctional situation, dysfunctional even in the eyes of the people that I was interviewed. So we need to ask, where is this coming from? It comes from the fact that growth in African cities has not followed industrialization, unlike in North. The fact that these are jobless cities where people desperate to leave the countryside migrate to cities in the hope of something better that is very hard to find. And so if you begin to pay attention to these pathways, you realize that to talk about agency in a way that is meaningful, and that would even add not patronizing, you need to pay attention to the serious economic and political constraints that, uh, against which agency need to be understood. Now, enough theory, enough deconstruction or distractions. What is a better way to study the cities and informal economies? For me, it became, it boiled down to asking, uh, being an interest in how public transport works in Dar es Salaam. And given my uh, 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 reliance on uh, uh, a radical political economy, I rephrased this question in terms of for whom it works. And th there are three fundamental questions that binds the, the three chapters, all the chapters of the book. The first one is, who owns what in public transport in Dar es Salaam? Who owns the buses, who owns the stations, who owns the roads? Uh, uh, and that is a first question I pose. The second one is, who does what with what they own? And if you ask these two questions, then you realize that there is a wealth of actors with different interest stakes in public transport. And then there is the question about power and politics trying to understand how is power exercised by different actors with different stakes in public transport. So I'm going to take you now through the seven stops that the book makes uh, to highlight more what the questions are rather than the contents, the answers that I, I provide. So stop number one is about setting the scene, bigger picture, uh, stuff and is uh, uh, tracing the journey from uh, a time in the late 60s, 70s when state provision was provided by the government under monopoly regime to the pervasive uh, deregulation and liberalization that begins in the early 80s and continues and reaches its peak in the 90s and then uh, uh, up to the present day. And to, to make sense of the messy uh, details that you, you trace there, uh, mostly through uh, newspaper uh, tracing, because being so political, public transport is very well covered in newspapers, so it's a great source. Newspapers are a great source to understand uh, the trends over time. And there are two important concepts that are useful for me to make sense of this transition. The first one is neoliberalism. There is indeed uh, this clear political project that one way or another is associated with the attempt to provide uh, the freedom of uh, uh, private investors and capital at the expenses of the regulation. Uh, and that, uh, that is uh, something that uh, is really visible as you trace the developments over time. And uh, as you can see from this photo, the, the regulation of public transport in Dar es Salaam was not uh, 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 really showing the superior efficiency of the private sector, which was the idea that was driving these reforms. It became very chaotic, and the private buses known as Dala Dala, that became the main provider of public transport, are infamous for their speeding practices, for overloading the vehicles, for uh, uh, the constant tensions with students who are entitled to discounted fares that uh, transport providers refuse to uh, agree to. And because of that, there is a fair amount of uh, unhappiness, discontent with uh, the benefits of this reform. And that's where the second concept comes in. And the second concept I use in the book is post-socialism. This is, let's not forget, Tanzania was one of the most ambitious socialist projects in Africa. And what you see is that over time, time and again, the government is trying to respond to the chaos that the regulation is creating by mobilizing <laughs> Uh, uh, so socialist ideas, values, uh, to try to bring back some degree of set control of the sector, 
However, it does this in a very uh, contradictory way because no matter what the values immobilize, the state has very limited capacity to intervene with the strength in the transport system. Stop number two is about unpacking the private sector, these mini buses that have become the main sources of public transport. I ask again who owns what in terms of the buses, who does what, and what are the sources of actors' power. And what I find through uh, both uh, quantitative research, a questionnaire, a survey, answered by about 700 of these workers and interviews, is that uh, class stratification is uh, central to understand the nature of uh, uh, transport provision by the private sector. Because you have a clear-cut stratification between those who own the buses and uh, those who work on the buses without owning even a sticker of these buses. So what are the, I ask, who are the owners? What type of uh, profiles do these workers have? Very limited education, fairly young, uh, and the most importantly ask what type of employment relationship links owners to uh, workers and uh, I think uh, this slide this photo is the most brilliant synthesis of how to understand the labor market in three words uh, this guy has written in Swahili Kazimbaya Ukiwanayo which means bad job comma if you have one so in Dar es Salaam if you are an unskilled worker, uh, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are desperate to get this work. And work, as I was explaining, is not something that is easily available. So there is a huge um, unbalance in the power of uh, owners vis-a-vis -vis workers. And what happens is, therefore, bus owners don't wage workers, don't exploit workers through exploitative wages they operate these buses through the so-called Eshabu, Arabic word for bill system. So if I'm the owner, I'm gonna ask to you, my worker, to bring me back $100 at the end of each day. On top of that, you will pay for petrol. On top of that, you will pay for the bribing police, if that is what happened, for a flat tire, if this is what the day brings you. So in this way, what is certain at the end of each day is the amount of money that the bus owner will make Whatever is left uh, on top of all this expenditure will be the daily return of workers. So what you can see, why is attention to class? Why is asking who wants what, who does what important? Because the many inefficiency of the provision of public transport by these minibuses are actually rooted in very problematic and unsolved labor relations. Why am I saying this? Because these workers are speeding like crazy because they are trying to maximize the number of trips that they can make each day. They are overloading the vehicle because they are trying to maximize the number of fares that they can sell for each uh, trip. They are refusing to transport students because nobody is compensating them for the loss of uh, money that they make for every student that they take on board. So the main inefficiency in the public transport are a response by workers to a very tight squeeze by bus owners that add its root in this problem. Bad job, comma, if you have one. So I look at that in this uh, stop, and then I engage with uh, a puzzle that emerged. So these are official statistics. They tell you that if you look at informal employment, wage employment, that is key to my story, is worth only 0.7% of employment. Well, if you put together self-employment without employees or with employees, you get a staggering 97%, right? So the research question was, am I hallucinating in discovering the story about wage work, precarious wage work, or is there something very wrong with the way statistics on informal employment are made? And uh, I wasn't hallucinating because by triangulating the words that these workers use in Swahili, and the words used by Labour Force Survey to create these numbers, I find that uh, the, the wording of this uh, Labour Force Survey is deeply inadequate. It is a, a conceptualization of formal sector wage employment that makes it impossible for informal workers to identify themselves as a wage worker.
Stop number three is about, so this is a, a, a part of the field work that is taking place in the late 90s. So I'm asking, why are 30,000, 20,000, 30,000 workers sharing the same problem and condition of exploitation in a city uh, fail to organize? Uh, why is there no institution representing their interests? Why are they not uh, taking on employers, the state? And so it became a study of uh, understanding the sources of workers' power, the vulnerability, and the, the main barriers to political organization that I found to be labor heterogeneity, and lots of different transport workers operating these minibuses in a way that I haven't got time to explain in details. Uh, and another thing I do at this stage is say, okay, never mind the failure to express their interest through an institution. So you see a lot of uh, uh, informal association linking these workers uh, uh, through uh, informal saving system that then create informal welfare funds. So I try to study uh, the forms uh, uh, of this solidarity between workers attending these meetings, trying to ask about workers about what was the meaning of this action, and trying to use this in a, as an entry point to understand the limits to political organization that I was describing before. Stop number four is about field work that takes place from 2008. And when I went back to Dar es Salaam, the situation had changed dramatically. These workers had started an association called Uwamadar, which is uh, uh, the union of driver and conductors of uh, uh, public buses in Dar es Salaam. And this became a branch of the transport trade union so I tried to understand, given my study of the constraints to political organization of the late 90s, how did workers organize? What was the spark? What was the strategy to organize? What was the division of labor between these two institutions? What was the strategy to claim labor rights from employer? And what were the results? And although I'm not telling a story that will want to make you stand up and start singing the international, what you do find is that these workers, through pressure on the state, uh, are able to uh, make employment contracts a part, one of the required documentations for being given a license as a public transporter in that side. So that shows the importance and the, the, the potential of these kind of actions. Stop number five is uh, really taking on this very important uh, insight that comes from uh, the writing of one of these workers. There is a whole world of writings on these buses that is in itself worth some serious attention. So this guy is saying, get rich or die trying. And that is a very important issue to understand if you want to understand these public transport systems because you might think that this is very hard and uh, there is a lot of hardship, but are these careers, no matter how brutal they look to the outsiders, something that can fuel micro dynamics of accumulation, upward mobility, or are these people who actually die trying to become richer? As you can imagine, this is a very challenging question from an empirical point of view, because you're trying to trace uh, employment trajectory of occupational mobility and mobility through a, 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 a sample a, a, a unit of analysis that is in constant flux and for which there's no record as far as the state is concerned. So what I did was I had lists of uh, the members of uh, the informal association that I was mentioning a few stops back. So that gave me a useful list of about 130 people that I knew were minibus workers back in 2001. And at two points in time, in 2009 and in 2014, I asked to two sets of uh, informants what were the occupational whereabouts of uh, these names. And what was interesting is that only a handful of people disappeared through the cracks. People know where people are. And the findings are sobering because you find that in 2009, 64% is still working on Daladala Dala, uh, and 36% is doing other jobs. In 2014, so 13 years on, 48%, nearly 50% of the sample is still working on Daladalas. 52% has moved to other jobs. Within this sample, you have uh, 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 about three quarters that are about very micro and slow upward mobility. People who have become taxi driver, private chauffeurs, 
the best ones are lorry drivers but then you have about one fourth of this uh, uh, group that has a tragic stories people who burn out get squeezed out of the labor market two of my informants were stoned to death because they were found stealing from uh, uh, wealthier houses in Dar es Salaam people who descend into addiction into alcohol uh, and the drugs so the point is to conceptualize this informal work as a gene which you quickly get stronger through this and then move on to other things is misleading if you look at where people are 13, 14 years later. And what was interesting as well was to contrast what workers were telling me in the late 80s about the fact that this work on these minibuses was a passing time job that they were doing just because they didn't have right then a better opportunity but for half of my sample this passing time job has become a lifetime occupation. And then you want to open your eyes to the fact that there is very uh, limited, uh, small scale uh, uh, upward mobility. But I think it's important to emphasize how slow the pace of upward mobility is. Because if you think of a classroom with 30 people in it, only one person every year is able to graduate to something better. So in this stop, I also present the, the very potted the occupational biography of about 12 of these workers to try to put some uh, flesh into the crude numbers that these kind of trends suggest. Second last stop is about BRT, because uh, bus rapid transit has been announced as imminent as early as in 2002, and then I was able to trace the, 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 the politics of its implementation at the remarkable slow pace uh, which it was implemented uh, uh, through the 2000 and 2010s. Why do I call B bus rapid transit the new face of neoliberalism? Because I think what is interesting is that if you study Dar es Salaam public transport system in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, there's no money whatsoever to try to attack the, the, the public transport problems that there are because the, 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 the direction of policy making is driven by austerity, by the fact that the government resources have been cut down, the fact that the government is really trying to intervene in terms of policy making uh, in public transport with very limited funds, and this is what creates this kind of chaos, right? Then why is that still new liberalism? Because then you have all of a sudden a game change, which is bus rapid transit, all of a sudden 150 million dollars become available to completely transform public transport, to create huge government departments that have capacity to uh, do policy making in ways that were simply unconceivable in the 90s and 2000s. And I think what you need to ask is, who owns BRT? What is BRT for? So in this chapter, I do two things. One is, what I try to debunk what I call the BRT Evangelical Society. Uh, there is, if you read the literature of BRT, this uh, evangelical society that is pushing really hard this propaganda, telling you how wonderful BRT is, starting from Bogota, but all over the world. And Bogota is very important because it is the ultimate flagship project, the win-win stories that shows you why BRT is good for the environment, for the poor, for the economy. But if you start unpacking this evangelical society, you see a very controversial, problematic, and comfortable uh, nexus between uh, funding, who controls the funds of BRT, knowledge, who controls the research of BRT, and power, which is again, what's in it, BRT, for all these actors? And who are the actors? The World Bank. The World Bank is opening up through BRT public transport to international finance, because BRT is funded through loans that, of course, need to be repaid. Then there are some NGO brokers that are really important in making BRT happen. ITDP, I don't know whether you come across this organization, conveniently based in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, Embark, they are the organization that provide all the know-how, they help you with the planning, they give you the links, the funds to visit Bogota and see how wonderful BRT is. Then they take you to Washington to open up these credit lines and they pump out these uh, incredibly enthusiastic narratives about BRT in a way that is very effective if totally misleading. Then there is the Volvo Foundations. Why is Volvo interested in BRT? Any ideas? 
be providing um, the, well, the actual cars versus the... I'm cunning, isn't it? You know, and then they are the main founders of the DRT Center for Excellence. So there is this story that is very basic and very easy to tell, but I think it's important, it's often forgotten, because this literature about BRT is systematically framing out of the picture the problems with BRT. And what are the problems? The problems are that they are associated with increases in fares, and this is, of course, when you come about inclusion, inclusion social inclusion and public transport as very heavy costs. They are associated with the concentration of the ownership of buses in the hands of few companies. That might be good for some, it might be other, but in Dar es Salaam it was very problematic because no Tanzanians were able to come up with that kind of capital scale to own it. Uh, and then there is the issue of debt. You are given this rosy story saying, we're going to build BRT. It's going to cost to build it, but once it's ready, you're going to have the same fares as the previous system, and it's going to be self-sufficient financially to run. But once the infrastructure is built, and in other words, the ship has sailed, you can't do anything else, you find yourself that the fares are significantly more expensive and it's not self-sufficient to run financially. So the state will have to start pumping subsidies in to continue. So. If you read it like this, you can see why BRT is not a win-win story. It is a major intervention that makes some players better off, some others worse off. And because there are some people who are worse off, uh, that's why in Dar es Salaam, these people with strong roots in the public transport system were not happy to be displaced by BRT so easily. And that's why we explained the, 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 the turtle pace at which BRT was implemented in Dar es Salaam from 2002 to 2015 until uh, it, it was final. And that what the book tries to do is trace the politics of the clash between the World Bank and the government, and the fact that the government is in between the World Bank and these uh, local actors, most notably bus owners and uh, uh, workers, are very concerned about the destruction and employment that BRT is tracing. So, Mine is a study of a resistance to BRT, but not resistance in terms of saying no to BRT, but rather domesticating BRT, trying to find force space for these actors to be accommodated into BRT, and in so doing, changing the shape and outlook of BRT, which looks very different from what the World Bank would have done to it. So wrapping up, the last stop, route ends, and there is this worker that says, we are also human. I think it's very important and I think very, uh, it helps me to engage again with the, uh, the two theoretical bodies of work that I was trying to engage. So we're also human. For me, the main problem is that the literature on ordinary city is actually talking about extraordinary cities. Extraordinary cities because these are cities of ghosts. Uh, and I'm saying that these are cities of ghosts because there is this problem that if you read this work, you find that there is over this reference to uh, the urban poor, amorphously defined, people at the grassroots, a number of actors that tend to float uh, suspended from reality, from materiality, uh, in a way that really doesn't pay justice to this talk and reference to the everyday. So the point I want to make is there is a huge problem to me of uh, the, the incapacity of lack of interest by post-colonial scholars to understand and pin down materiality. And if you fail to do that, I'm not quite sure how you're going to try to uh, bring forward the radical imaginings and interventions that rest on concepts that are so vague as people as infrastructure, for example. What does it mean to, to draw on people as infrastructure to make Dar es Salaam a better place? So the point is to that this post-colonial emphasis on agency, on the creative power of uh, everyday initiatives is totally undermined by the lack of substantive attention to the economic and political structures in which, against which everyday activities by people needs to be understood. Because if you do pay attention to this reality, you start telling, a, you are forced, I think, to tell a very sad story about despondency, about desperation. Like this quote from Dotto, who is a guy who spent his entire life shouting destinations of buses and feeling buses one after the other. He says, 
Any man with a sound brain knows that shouting a destination and pulling people into a bus is not a joke. We do it because we are in trouble. And then Dotto adds a very important point that is cleverness without results is pointless. I think post-colonial writers often mistake the desperate efforts to find a place in these very unhospitable cities with the capacity to shape society, to make it uh, livable. And so Dotto is saying, I might be clever to create this job out of nowhere, but where has it taken me? Cleverness without results is pointless. Another quote by this guy, I can't put this photo because he was fully drunk at 10 a.m. in the morning. There is an obvious problem of uh, alcohol, uh, despond um, escapism, and, and drug addiction that you can't avoid noticing if you spend time at this station. Say, so we sit here, we talk, a life of trouble, deep trouble. You sit with hunger as you see me today. I haven't got any bus or anything else. Mr. Lepa is a guy from Tanga, which is 250 miles away from Dar es Salaam. His family is down there, and he describes the tragedy of his position. I can go and visit when things are going well. How can I go when I haven't got even the money for breakfast? I will have to go and see them without enough money, not with 10,000 shillings. So you need a job, 100,000 shillings at least to go there. The money for the bus ticket to and from Tanga, clothes for my parents and the family, and enough money to use while I'm there. How can you get this money with this work? We live like birds. Actually, a bird is better off as he knows that he will eat. There is no way out. So these are not realities that uh, allow me to spin an upbeat story about the power of the everyday. And that's where I'm coming from, to conclude that when Peterson worried that there is a real danger, that material deprivation becomes the only thing we care when we write about the city, my concern is the opposite. There is a, 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 an unsubstantiated celebration of the everyday that post-colonial narratives are associated with. And this is problematic because it crowds out an understanding of the concrete realities that ordinary urban Africans face, and therefore understanding the possibility of overcoming these challenges. Final, final point is more about approaches, methodology, I think it's really problematic, this uh, caricaturization of a political economy of something that is crude, functionalist, and reductionist. It seems to me that a historically and empirically grounded political economy remains the best approach at our disposal to understand urban realities. And that means to be very interested in understanding variations, diversity, and complexity, but without falling into this extreme relativism of saying that every city is ordinary. So I go back to asking the same question that I started with. How do we understand the urban experience in Africa in contrast to other parts of the world? I would say four points. First of all, that we cannot bypass an attention to different levels of capitalist, we put it in bracket if it, if it unnerves you, development. Marked difference in, a, in economic growth are crucial because they are reflected in difference in income and they have a profound impact on urban outcomes and urban possibilities. So what we need is a contextualized understanding of public transport as part of urban capitalism, which is a key pillar. And today, in the 21st century, this means understanding what forms neoliberalism takes, its tensions and contestations, of which, taken for a ride, wants to be a, a specific study of this in one country. Thank you for listening, and I'm done.